um, took a number of debate trainers to Rwanda, and that's really what drew my attention to the work that he does. And they worked with 150 young people, is that right, 150, in partnership um, with a leading advocacy charity. And so the work that he does really isn't just limited to debating here, and actually the impact that he has is quite significant. So if you'd like to refer to the websites, please do. I'll hand it over to Tony now so he can get started on introducing the other speakers and also the format for tonight. Thank you very much, Shavana, for, for the very flattering introduction. Um, for any um, fellow members of the Liberal Democrats who might be watching this video, she was talking about James. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, other than that, uh, in all seriousness, um, it is a, a great pleasure, a privilege um, to be here for, for this event. Um, one of the key aims of Debating London is to foster greater collaboration across London, which means working with a whole range of different uh, debate clubs and speaker clubs in order to promote the virtue of the civic debate and public participation. Um, we call ourselves the Debate Club for Adults, and it is intended to carry a double meaning with that. Um, there is, of course, the literal interpretation, which is we are one of the few clubs in London that are exclusively for adults. Normally, a debate club is something that's associated with universities or with schools, and yet most of our members are people who never had the opportunity or to be, um, never managed to take advantage of the opportunity to join a debate club at school or university and only realised the value it had for them when they left. Uh, debating London is, is their uh, second chance. Um, it's also a debate club for adults because our aim is to fill what we consider to be a, a vacuum in political debate, public debate, about the issues that concern us most. Um, we, we are generally concerned about the level of hyperbole that tends to dominate public debates over very controversial issues human rights being just one of them, with the result being that debate is polarised, and you have two <coughs> severe consequences of that, which is on the one hand, only the loudest voices get heard rather than a breadth of voices and perspectives, and on the other hand, you have people insulating themselves from debate and discussion, as exemplified by the safe space movement that we see now proliferating, proliferating across many of the UK's universities because of the number of people who feel intimidated by a public debate. And we aim to create a safe space for people to engage in debate with each other because our central belief is that a great debate isn't just about hearing both sides of the argument, but both sides of the argument hearing each other. And the way we do this at Debate in London is not just hosting public debates like this, but challenging our members and providing the platform to represent positions they don't actually agree with, in order to task them with examining other perspectives and gaining an appreciation for the other side, for people who hold different views from their own. So that by the end of the experience, they would have at least had an opportunity to rigorously test their own beliefs and been in a better position to prove why they believe they're right, and they might even have changed their opinion, as I have many occasions, uh, having chaired debates um, every month for the last six years here. So it's an incredible privilege to be hosted by an organisation like City Circle that shares those key values, and it is the reason why we are all here tonight. So let me explain how tonight's debate is going to work, let me introduce our speakers to you, and let me tell you how you can get involved as well. First and foremost, the format for tonight's debate. Tonight's debate. Quite simply, we give each of our speakers five minutes to make their case to you. We have a motion as opposed to a question. A motion means that we have a proposition that one side will advance and defend and the other side will oppose. That proposition in this case is that the Human Rights Act should be abolished. There is an additional debate to be had in the back of that about what should replace it, whether that should be the much-discussed 
UK Bill of Rights that has been proposed by the UK Conservative Party. However, the focus of the debate is whether the Human Rights Act should be abolished, mainly because we don't have a clear idea of exactly what would constitute a Bill of Rights that would take its place. So on my right, we have two speakers, both members of Debating London and our new training programme, the Great Debaters Club. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have here joining us who volunteered to take part in this um, prestigious debate. We have, first of all, uh, James Hamlet. James is an intelligence analyst at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. He is an active member of the Evening Central and Acton Conservatives and a member of the Great Debaters Club. To his right, in spirit, if not yet in person, we have a Paul Carroll, who is due to arrive here within the next few moments, who will be accompanying him. A native of New York City, Paul Carroll is the founding member of another club that we regularly collaborate with, the London Debaters 104 Toastmasters. Notable because they are the first Toastmasters club devoted to debating in the UK. He had offers more than 13 years in finance, and more recently he's become a trainer in finance and of public speaking. I think you're going to enjoy hearing from Paul tonight. To my left and opposing tonight's motion, we have, first of all, Susan Brown. An American lawyer and a barrister practicing out of Garden Court Chambers. She has a wealth of human rights experience, most recently as head of Human Rights Watch UK. Her legal career has included work at the War Crimes Tribunal in Sierra Leone and the UN Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. She is a Harvard graduate and a Fulbright scholar and has lectured extensively on human rights and humanitarian law. And supporting her, to her left, is Jason Maud, co-founder of Debating London uh, all of six years ago. Seems like so much longer and it all seems like just yesterday too. Jason is a software engineer who first got involved in debating at school. We actually met at university in our first year at the University of Nottingham's Debating Club, which the two of us then went on to run. Uh, in 2009, he founded Debating London, then known as the Central London Debating Society, in partnership with myself, after we decided that we were tired of not having a place where graduates could go to continue developing their skills, first nurtured at university, and thought, why wait for somebody else to set up a debate club for adults when we can do it? We had a total of seven people at that very first debate, which is on bank, which is on the banking crisis and whether the bankers should be held accountable for the Great Recession that had, had really just kicked in at that point. We had a total of seven people in the audience, which is also equivalent to our total membership. <laughs> in the last six years, that has grown to over three and a half thousand. And I owe a lot of that to Jason and Harry has taken almost every debate that we've had, often writing in-depth summaries that are of immeasurable value to our members, and simply none of this would be possible without it. So I offer a, a great debt of gratitude to Jason. I'm very glad um, to, to host him here along with our esteemed speakers. As for you, how you can get involved, as I mentioned. Each of our speakers has five minutes to make their case to you, in which they can advance their arguments and cross-examine each other's arguments. After that, I hand over to you for 20 minutes of Q&A. Now, I want to take as many points as possible from you. So that means that I will ask two things of you. First of all, if you have a comment you would like to make, as opposed to a question, then I will consider that a standalone comment, and I will not invite a reply from the speakers to it. However, if you would like to ask a question that would get a reply, then what I will do is I will take two or three questions at a time and invite our speakers to offer some thoughts um, over all of those questions and try and give you as thorough reply as possible. But my main aim, having been briefed by Shubhan about how interactive 
these events are, is to make sure we hear from as many of you as possible in the time allowed. And of course, at the end of the debate, we have our vote. So that we, you, can set, you can tell us who you thought deserved to win tonight's debate. There are several facts that will go into this decision, where you stand personally on this issue. Whilst I always encourage people to vote on the basis of how persuasive the speakers were, it will be folly of me to suggest that it will be easy for you to separate that, that judgment from where you stand on the issue personally. That is your starting point, which affects the burden of proof you apply to each of the arguments you hold. Plus, it is a genuine challenge for our speakers that they have to deal with when addressing real human beings like themselves in real life to deal with any preconceptions and assumptions you have. So I just ask for a single vote as opposed to separate votes on where you stand personally and what you thought of the speakers. Instead, what I'm really looking to gauge tonight is how many of you would have changed your minds over the course of the debate, which we can attribute directly to our speakers. And the way we'll be doing that is by taking a vote before the debate starts and then another vote at the end and seeing what the swing is. So that way, we understand not just who won the debate, but who changed the most minds. Which moves me on to our preliminary vote that I will take now before we open tonight's debate with uh, James's speech. The motion reads, this house would abolish the Human Rights Act. Before you vote, again, a few things to consider about the burden of proof here. What we're asking from the proposition is to explain why the Human Rights Act is no longer fit for purpose. If they want to offer a specific alternative on what should replace it, they are free to do so, but they're not obliged to do so. However, what we will be expecting from them is to list the typical outcomes they might expect from a piece of legislation that might replace the Human Rights Act and to explain why that would be more beneficial, more desirable than the outcomes currently yielded by the Human Rights Act itself. The reason for me saying this is that I don't want you to judge them on the, basis of, on the basis that we don't have a Bill of Rights, a draft bill, a draft bill of rights rather, before us right now to compare directly with the Human Rights Act. I want to think about their arguments as to why the Human Rights Act itself is not currently fit for purpose. And what should any potential replacement of the Human Rights Act seek to achieve? And why is that incompatible with the current legislation? Similarly, the opposition needs to prove why the Human Rights Act is fit for purpose. They need to prove either why the outcomes, the negative outcomes that the proposition is going to advance are simply not real or not as bad as they're made out, or why they're at least offset by all the positives that they might portray as being the consequences of having the Human Rights Act, and why they're certainly outweighed by the harms of removing it. So that's how I want to think about this debate when you are judging those arguments. So now I'd like to you, let's take that vote. Once more, this House would abolish the Human Rights Act. You have three options. You can vote in favour of the motion, you can vote against the motion, and if you're genuinely undecided, you can abstain. All those in favour of abolishing the Human Rights Act, and it's your own personal position, your starting point, please raise your hands now. One. <laughs> it's about the same as number we had. Are you still counting the one? Okay. All those against <laughs> abolishing the Human Rights Act. Remember, you can still abstain. All those against, please raise your hands now. It's all default position. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Fourteen. Fourteen. Now, perhaps I ask you to do that one more time to make sure I haven't miscounted. One, two, three, so four, five, six. So? Can you just repeat the motion? The motion that we're voting on is whether the Human Rights Act should be abolished. I'm asking who's in favour of that, 
and who is against that and who is undecided. The vote we were just thinking there is how many of you are against abolishing the Human Rights Act, your own personal position. That's what you're, I'm asking to show your hands for. So, beg your pardon, one more time. If you are opposed, please raise your hands now. Six. I count 21. The unit is not quite right. The basic point there is it's a lot more than in favour. That's what we need to know right now. All those undecided, all those who want to abstain from the first vote, please raise your hands now. So our starting point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that we have one person in favour of abolishing human rights act, 21 people opposed, and 13 people abstaining. So there are still plenty to play for, no pressure on the opposition here. <laughs> that leads me, therefore, to, to see if the speakers can change your mind over the course of the debate. I would like to officially welcome Paul, who has just arrived. I have done a formal introduction, Paul, um, and we're going to first of all hear from James to open the case for tonight, for the proposition for tonight's debate. Welcome, James. You have five minutes, no points of information on that. Welcome, James. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much, Tony, for that introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, no, man, no free man shall be imprisoned, outlawed, harmed, or in any way harmed, except by the judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Ladies and gentlemen, those words were written 800 years ago in the Magna Carta, and they still exist in English law today. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we on this side of the House will be arguing that Britain should abolish the Human Rights Act and that it should replace it with a British Bill of Rights. Our proposal is that the Human Rights Act should be superseded immediately upon the enactment of the British Bill of Rights. Our argument is that the Human Rights Act is unnecessary, that it is ill-planned uh, Ill and poorly written, and that it not only does no good, but that it actively causes harm. By contrast, our Bill of Rights would remove the ambiguity put into British law by the Human Rights Act, it would clarify the existing rights under the European Convention of Human Rights, and it would prevent the reinterpretation of our laws by a foreign court which undermines parliamentary sovereignty. So, ladies and gentlemen, what does the abolition of the slave trade and the abolition of slavery, the English Bill of Rights in 1689, and the enfranchisement of women including five separate representation of the People's Acts, all have in common. These were all examples of Britain enhancing human liberty and entrenching human rights before 1953, which was the date of the passage of the European Convention on Human Rights. Similarly, uh, the abolition of capital punishment and the extension of the franchise to 18-year-olds happened after 1953, but before 1998, which was the date of the passage of the Human Rights Act. So, these demonstrate two things. First, that Britain has a long, proud and illustrious history of defending human liberty and enhancing human rights. And secondly, that British citizens were already protected under the European Court of Convention on Human Rights after 1953, but before 1998. These laws were passed in the spirit of the ECHR. They did not need a Human Rights Act 
in order for them to be passed. So what are the harms of the, the Human Rights Act? Well, Section 2 of the Human Rights Act states that UK courts must take into account the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. This form of wording is ambiguous. It's unclear as to whether UK courts must defer to Strasbourg or whether they can uh, defy it. That ambiguity is a key harm caused by the Human Rights Act and it is something that our Bill of Rights would do away with. Where it comes to interpreting the will of British parliamentary sovereignty, uh, there can be no ambiguity. The human, the, over the years, the Strasbourg Court has steadily reinterpreted the Ruling, the, the original rulings from the European uh, Convention of Human Rights to extend them beyond their original intent. This is known as mission creep. Um, and it causes active harm because it leads to examples such as uh, the European uh, Court of Human Rights ruling that those convicted of some of the worst crimes, including murder, could not have life sentences imposed upon them. This creates conflict and this creates harmful confrontation between the UK and Strasbourg. So in summary, the Human Rights Act is unnecessary, it is ill thought out and poorly worded, and it not only does no good, but actively causes harm. Let me close with the words of the English poet John Milton in his address to Parliament in 1644. He said, remember what nation it is whereof ye are. A nation not slow and dull, but quick and piercing of wit. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you tonight to support the motion and remember what nation it is whereof ye are. Thank you very much, James, and perfectly timed, might I add, as well. I now hand over to the first speaker for the opposition, Susan. Welcome, Susan. the most extraordinary arguments put forward by those who do without the Human Rights Act is the fact that it is on one hand a document we don't need at all, and then on the other hand a document which is completely destructive. It seems to me we we'll need to make our decision one way or the other. I think before I begin I'd like to point out a couple of inconvenient facts which undermine the arguments that have been put forward. When it comes to interpreting the law, there's absolutely no question. Strasbourg is, and by, I, by saying Strasbourg, I mean the European Court of Human Rights. They have been completely clear in their decisions. The UK Supreme Court has been completely clear in their decisions. The final word on interpretation of all UK legislature is, of course, the UK Supreme Court. There's no question about that. Again, in terms of looking at the examples that have been used this evening, the fact that the UK government, as my opponent says, could not impose life sentences, that this was set aside by the European Court of Human Rights, not so. What the European Court of Human Rights said in its judgment, completely consistent with the other rulings that it had made throughout the years, was that in order to pass a life sentence, the person who's the subject of it has to have some means of communicating, of making some kind of complaint. So in other words, gone were the ideas that we could find someone who needed to be in prison for life, lock them up and throw away the key. The only thing, literally the only thing the UK government had to do as a result of this uh, European Court of Strasbourg uh, decision was built in a mechanism whereby the prisoner had the opportunity to have that sentence reviewed one time. That's it. One time. And the, the opinion actually said there's absolutely no requirement that any particular standard of review be put forward by the, the government reviewing. So let's just look at that. The headline 
Again, very well put out by my opponent. The headline, the European Court of Human Rights, the Human Rights Act, is here to stop us from sending horrible murderers to life sentences. Great headline. Very destructive. What's the reality? Couldn't be further from it. All it means is that prisoners at one point during their lives have an opportunity to be heard whether they should, again, be released. When it comes to ambiguity, again, absolutely no question. Any ambiguity uh, is cleared up by the fact that in the prisoner voting rights case, for example, the UK Supreme Court said, all we have to do is take into account the jurisprudence, the laws that come out of the European Court of Human Rights. That's it. All we have to do is say, we have taken account of that jurisprudence. That's it. You don't have to give it any particular standard of review. You don't have to articulate the extent to which you have rejected it. You only have to take it into consideration. Finally, the third, and what I will ask you to find, the most outrageous exaggeration used by my opponent, saying that somehow the European Court of Human Rights uh, is undermining the sovereignty of Parliament. Name for me one, one case where it was not common law, where it was not a legal decision as a result of common law. Name for me one case where an act of parliament was set aside by the European Court of Human Rights. That won't take you long. And with that, I move to the second speaker for the proposition to extend the case in favour of the motion. I welcome Paul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, more than 60 years now uh, since the adoption of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, since which time the court has moved away from the original intentions of the Convention and has interpreted the Convention, which is, in fact, not an interpretation, but inventing new doctrines uh, which are not in the Convention and not agreed to by members. For instance, and I will come to this uh, in, in, a, uh, uh, in a moment, Protocol 1 of Article 3 does not, does not give a right to vote. It does, not, it does not spell out what the rules of enfranchisement are in order for uh, elections to be democratic. And there are many people, uh, there are many people in many European countries who cannot vote. Now, of course, the problem is not, as my, uh, as my colleague said, the problem is not with the European Convention on Human Rights. It is with the 1998 Human Rights Act passed by the Blair government. And as many things that were passed by the Blair government, it was not particularly well thought out what the implications of this would be and what the ramifications of this were going to be, effectively cutting and pasting sections of the convention into UK law. And their, their record on cutting and pasting was not really all that stellar. Uh, section 2... Uh, section 2.1 of the Human Rights Act of 1998 says, A court or tribunal determining a question which has arisen in connection with a convention right must take into account any judgment, decision, declaration, or advisory opinion of the European Court of Human Rights whenever made or given so far as in the opinion of the court or tribunal it is relevant to the proceedings in which that question has arisen. Now, the, the problem, as my colleague said, is the ambiguity of taking into account. What does taking into account mean? Now, UK courts, uh, UK courts and lawyers uh, are accustomed to working within the tradition of the common law, which is based in the system of precedence, where earlier decisions are treated as either binding or near binding. And most continental countries, of course, don't have the same concept or precedent uh, of, of common law, um, uh, common law or precedent uh, tradition, 
And in practice, therefore, they are less likely to treat the Strasbourg court as if it's some higher superior court bolted on top of the common law system. So again, the problem isn't so much with the, uh, even the court as it is with the 1998 British Act. Because no one is proposing abolition of rights in Britain. The UK courts are deferential to this ambiguous take into account uh, language because they are instructed to do so by the HRA, the Human Rights Act of 1998. As, as the opposition has said, the Supreme Court told the government that they had to take it into account. And it is not clear what take it into account means. In fact, I think the, the opposition has given a very good example of what is wrong with the act, uh, the ambiguity of this requirement to take into account and what? Ignore, throw out, make yourself ignore, pretend doesn't exist. Now, in the case, in the Hearst case, which, is, which was raised by, by both speakers, of the uh, votes for prisoners. Now, since it is uh, not in the convention that uh, spelling out exactly uh, who has the franchise and democratic elections are left to the national governments of the member states of the convention, um, some of which have a, 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 a very, very radically different interpretation of democratic enfranchisement than, the, uh, than Western Europe, uh, because of that, um, it is, as I said, uh, not within the, the purview of the court to say that uh, this is an incompatibility. Of course, the court has said <coughs> it's uh, issued the Declaration of Incompatibility, and what is Parliament, what is the government to do about it? Is it to defy? Uh, is it uh, not to defy? Is it to submit? Is it going to follow the tradition of case law and common law precedent and submit. That is what we seek to overturn, that level of ambiguity, because it is undermining of national democracy. In practice, uh, democracy can only, and accountability, can only be practiced at the national level, and international, international institutions have a tendency to be unaccountable and undemocratic. Thank you. And finally, to close the speeches, I move to the second speaker for the opposition, Jason. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. Um, so, I am going to, um, I, I am not a lawyer, so I am going to move this debate away from strictly legal matters, uh, which we have been focusing on to now, and take it more into the political territory which uh, Paul uh, started to, uh, to approach there. So the first thing I want to do is just reiterate something that my colleague said. Uh, the opposition have been um, banging on about uh, the fact that the, uh, the Human Rights Act is ambiguous, that it has this take into account clause, that no one's really sure what it means. My colleague could not have been more clear. There is no question the UK Supreme Court is supreme. It is, you know, it has, the, it, it can take into account, but it is supreme. So what that, what that implies about take into account is that they have to listen to what uh, Strasbourg says, but they can make a different judgment because that's what being supreme means. Um, so, <clears throat> I want to talk about two uh, aspects of this. The first is the internationality of human rights. Um, and the, the second one is the regional question around the UK of abolishing the Human Rights Act. So first of all, the internationality of human rights. Some rights are international. There has been a UN Declaration on Human Rights, uh, the European um, uh, Human Rights um, uh, the you know, European Declaration on Human Rights, they have, all of these things are pointing towards the fact that some human rights are international. Some human rights have, the, uh, have a sway across 
the whole globe, and it does not matter where you live, these rights apply, even if they, they, they cannot be applied in your particular circumstance, you still have them, and if they're not being applied to you, they are being violated. So it makes sense to start moving towards a framework in which human rights can be applied internationally, in which countries cannot start saying, yeah, we sort of pay lip service to the idea of human rights, um, as a sort of a human thing, wherever humans are, they have these human rights, but in reality we have our own interpretation of it. And that's a problem. We as a country want to help promote human rights across the world. We want to promote these rights of uh, equality before the law, the right to life and um, uh, you know, the bodily integrity and so on um, across the planet. And we can't do that if we start saying, yes, we, we, pay, we, we believe in human rights, but we have our own interpretation. Because other countries can then say, well, we believe in human rights too, but we have our own interpretation, which involves us um, you know, uh, being able to torture people, for example. We're allowed to do that because that's our interpretation. So we can't do this. If we want to promote human rights across the globe, we have to admit that human rights are international. They are, um, a, they are something that transcends boundaries and that applies to all humans. And as such, we've got to start following international codes. And if we start pulling out and saying, oh, but we're going to have our own interpretation of this, then we, uh, then we start going down the road of allowing other countries to have their own interpretations and encouraging, encouraging that rather than discouraging that, which is what we should be doing. Now, uh, secondly, the regional argument. Even if you think that all of what we have argued on the opposition is completely uh, a load of rubbish and that um, the, the, the proposition of right, the Human Rights Act is, is uh, too ambiguous and, uh, and doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't allow for parliamentary sovereignty, etc., etc., then um, you can still believe all of that but vote with the opposition because abolishing the Human Rights Act is politically impossible. In Wales, and in Scotland, the, uh, the, the, the parliaments they have there, the, the parliament or the assembly in Wales, were formulated under acts that incorporated the Human Rights Act. So these, these acts relied on the Human Rights Act being there. And um, the, so therefore, if we wanted to get rid of the Human Rights Act, if we wanted to scrap it or replace it with a British Bill of Rights, we would have to get the permission of Scotland and Wales, and the Scottish uh, uh, Parliament and the Welsh Assembly, and that would be politically impossible, as the Scottish Parliament has stated, and the Welsh Assembly has stated. Further to that, it would be even more impossible, because it is actually written into the Good Friday Agreement, which underpins the peace and stability in Northern Ireland, and a fragile peace and stability that is. So, if we were to try and get rid of the Human Rights Act, we would have to reopen negotiations on the Good Friday Agreement, reopen negotiations between uh, Sinn Féin and the DUP. And that would prove, uh, open up a whole can of worms, especially in the very fragile environment that Northern Ireland is now undergoing. So, to open, this, uh, open up and reopen the case of the Human Rights Act, try and get rid of it or replace it with the British Bill of Rights, would make us look um, isolated abroad, and would uh, be regionally impossible as it would uh, prove, uh, and might even indeed prove, uh, to cause more trouble than it's worth in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Jason, and to all four of our speakers who very much lived up to, and I say, and surpassed the uh, great expectations we had them to deliver a very interesting, informative, and engaging debate. However, of course, the debate is not just between them, it is also between you. So this is your chance to have your say. Again, I'll like explain the rules here. Um, please raise your hand if you would like to make a contribution from the floor. If it is a comment, I will not invite a reply from the, from the speakers. If it is a question, I will aggregate a few questions and then ask the speakers to reply collectively to them. And of course, please be brief as we have just 20 minutes to hear from all of you. So, hands up. Who has something to say? Fantastic. I will start with the four hands I've just seen. I will start over here and then I'll work my way across the room. So. 
Magnus, yeah. Tony, thank you very much. Um, I think it was uh, Charles Dickens who said um, in Bleak House that it is actually the business of the law to make business for the law. In fact, what he was implying uh, was that uh, it's the business of lawyer to create as much confusion uh, in order to, uh, in legal situations, in order to create as much uh, employment for themselves and to yeah, multiply yeah. the numbers of lawyers they can. And this uh, Human Rights Act that we've seen uh, come in through, pushed through by Blair, who else is of that uh, profession, uh, as indeed is his wife, uh, is perfectly understandable. I mean, there is a there is a, a perception now that if we didn't have this uh, uh, this this uh, Human Rights Act. There would be no human rights. We've never had any human rights in this country. Well, I mean, that is patently absurd because we've had a system of common law going back many hundreds of years, not perfect, but uh, good enough to teach other nations uh, to create a jurisprudential system for America, uh, for Australia, uh, for New Zealand, other English-speaking countries, and indeed it's the basis of uh, Indian law. In fact, England has actually taught other countries uh, about standards of rights. How much time have I got? Um, I, like I could go on <laughs> the whole evening because it raises such an enormous um, implication. However, I see I'm, I think I am isolated on this one, but that, that just proves my point um, because it's always an individual um, that's got common sense against the press. <laughs> 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 And even if you are isolated, I assure you are not ignored. <laughs> okay, so I saw some hands over on this side, which I'll turn to now. Um, yes, sir, and then I'll come back to you. As well. Please go ahead. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's an issue of human rights come, abolishing the Human Rights Act come into question because of certain speakers who have been promoting hate speech, but the issue comes in because they've been promoting hate speech and people want them extradited, but the extradition could lead them to being tortured in other countries and the Human Rights Act protects them and abolishing that would lead to speakers who have been convicted of crime but they would be deported to countries that don't have a good, uh, good um, history of human rights and they could potentially be tortured there because of what they're calling for a revolt against those particular countries and uh, trying to enforce more, I don't know, democratic type of system within those countries so, uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second, but we'll get the question addressed. I want to hear this point first, and then we'll put it back to one of the speakers. Go. Hi, I just wonder how a British Bill of Rights would differ in substance from the existing Human Rights Act. Okay, that's fine. So, let's take these two questions and very brief responses from our audience. Can I see a show of hands for those who would like to ask a question or offer a comment as well, just to gauge how many people we want to hear from? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, we'll come to you all in one group. I'll be per back from our speakers. May I ask one speaker for each side per question? There are two questions here. First one, um, won't, won't, won't the Bonnet and Human Rights Act essentially be used as a means of extraditing people um, who we accuse of hate speech uh, by the back door to countries that practice torture um, or other practices that we are opposed to, which is currently forbidden by the Human Rights Act. That's a question directed very much to the proposition, I think, so I'll ask you to respond to it first. On the, on the extradition, um, well, prior to uh, 1998, uh, it was the case, I, I believe, that um, anyone who was going to be extradited made his appeals to the Home Office, and the Home Secretary could uh, make those um, the, um, the decision on that. Uh, the human, the the sovereign right of countries to extradite non-citizens. I mean, obviously, the, the United Kingdom could not extradite um, a, uh, a, uh, a British uh, citizen because, of course, um, they, they would have no place to extradite a British citizen to other, other than within Britain. Uh, and if that person had not broken the law, 
then of course they, that person could not be imprisoned. Um, as far as the negotiation, I mean, <coughs> in the, the, the highest profile case where that, that was, uh, that was uh, done was settled by the agreement of the receiving country not to, uh, not to torture that person. Um, but it is, I would maintain that it is, it is still the, the sovereign right of, of a nation to deport um, foreign nationals whom it does not want on its soil. Now, whether it should do that in the case of a hate speaker being a, a free speech advocate, uh, I would say no. They they certainly shouldn't. But that's a uh, uh, but you know free free speech has has been uh, itself under attack. And uh, uh, you know anodyne speech it does not require nor deserve protecting. It it is in fact only the controversial speech. Which would uh, which would require protecting, which could be addressed in a, a free speech provision in the Bill of Rights. Um, that's you know, for that that particular question. Are we meant to address all of them at once? Um, no, just no, okay. One. Okay. Just very briefly, I would like to respond to the gentleman's comments about what the UK has done to teach others about human rights, uh, because he invites um, reference to the fact that, for example, when the president of Kenya was indicted by the International Criminal Court. The Inter International Criminal Court is um, a creation of uh, the Rome Statute, which Kenya signed. No question about that. But when the president of Kenya sought to tooth and nail fight the prosecution in the Inter International Criminal Court, who do you think he made reference to? The United Kingdom. And the way this government has done everything it could to undermine the stat of human rights. I could go on and on about Venezuela, about a number of other governments who have done that, but there's no question, unfortunately, that the UK government has taught them to do so. Uh, what the gentleman refers to, I believe, is the case of Abu Qatada, um, and what the opponent uh, that I'm responding to has overlooked is that the only way we were able to uh, deport Abu Qatada was because the government um, actually entered a treaty with the UK government because formal undertakings, promises by that government that if he comes here, um, he won't be subject to torture. You'll remember that what made that case a little bit unusual was not really the question of whether he would be tortured, but whether evidence that was gained as a result of torture would be used in the trial against him, right? And what they initially said was, send him back here, don't worry, we won't use the evidence, we won't have military trials, we won't do all of these things, we'll have standards that you would be satisfied with. In the end, the only thing that would satisfy the UK government was a treaty signed with that government. You will also remember, although it didn't make the headlines the way his deportation did, his return, in fact, it wasn't a deportation, he willingly decided to go back. What didn't make the headlines was they did use military tribunal. They did use evidence that was gained as a result of torture, and nobody cared. Okay. I reckon I'll ask our speakers to, to be equally uh, um, brief as possible. I wish I would compromise the substance of your responses, but to try and keep as brief as possible where possible. Um, let me move to the, the second question that was raised before I put it back out to the speakers, which is very briefly, I'll put this only to the proposition in this case. Um, in a few words, how would a Bill of Rights differ in substance from the Human Rights Act? So, um, the Bill of Rights would essentially, like I said, remove the ambiguity, it would not have the take into account wording in it. Uh, it would clarify the Convention rights. So uh, it would ensure that the convention rights are interpreted according to their original intent, not to the expanded intent that Strasbourg has um, uh, engaged in since uh, 1953. And it would uh, remove any possibility that Parliament's will could be interpreted by a court that was not a UK court. So the, uh, the, the, the opposition has said that um, there, is no, um, there is no doubt about this, right, that, that the UK court is supreme. Well, if that is the case, then 
why does Strasbourg, uh, why has Strasbourg, for example, um, ruled that prisoners do not have the right to vote and has reaffirmed this ruling, uh, despite an overwhelming vote from Parliament that says, um, sorry, that Strasbourg said that prisoners do have the right to vote, sorry, but the Parliament has said that they do not have the right to vote. Uh, if Strasbourg clearly has no jurisdiction there, why would they uh, continue with that ruling? Okay, I'm going to write a very brief word of reply from the opposition just because it was somewhat contentious claim made there that conflict was obviously in the debate before. Yeah, so why, why would Strasbourg say that? Because that's what Strasbourg believes. And the UK Parliament believes otherwise and has had a vote to say so. So I, I'm not really sure what the, what the ambiguity is here. Uh, Strasbourg says one thing, the UK Parliament says another thing. The UK uh, Supreme Court is supreme, so you know they, they've they've uh, they've taken into account what Strasbourg has said and and, and, and come up with a different response. No right that, that, that's yes, yeah, and, right and, 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 and prisoners still have no right to vote. That's all I'll take um, on that one. More questions. Let's take a, a large range of comments, please. Um, if you can also, we don't know enough, you can also tell us your name as well when you do offer your comment or question. Let's start with the lady um, in the third row. Yeah, please. Um, my name is Sarah. Um, the fact that another court can supersede um, a national court, I don't see that as a disadvantage. I think that's an advantage because surely one of the benefits of having um, a Human Rights Act is that if somebody, um, if, if a citizen is unhappy with uh, a decision of their own national court, they can then refer to the Human Rights Act. So it's, it's, it's a positive thing, is it not? Okay, so a good question indeed. Isn't it a positive thing, even if the proposition um, are right, that Strasbourg can overrule um, the UK courts? Isn't that a positive thing? I'll uh, bear that in mind, but I'm going to hear some more questions, comments first before I um, put that to the panel. Can we have some more hands, please? Um, let's move. Let's go to Shabana first, and then we'll come over to the side. Go ahead. Um, we've heard mention of this sort of climate that we're in where. England, the United Kingdom, seen as undermining the standards to which we promote and hold others to. So my question really is that, given the climate that we're in, shouldn't we be holding the human rights standards up even higher and more dearly, so that we can make clear the standards to which we do hold ourselves? Um, and also, the mention of the British Bill of Rights, wouldn't that go take us in a completely opposite direction in that we would be making it clear that we do hold human rights there, but only for the British. Okay, and over on this side, I'll cut, I will come to you as well, sir. I'm over on this side, yes, sir, at the front. Hi, it's on the camera, Ben. Um, could the presence of the um, European Convention on Human Rights have either prevented or slowed down the genocide and and discrimination that took place in Yugoslavia in the 1990s and in Germany in the 1930s. And if so, um, does the presence of, and the link between the UK courts and the Convention um, give us something of a check and balance which we don't want to lose, lose sense of going on? Okay. Just to make sure I understood that, you're saying couldn't the enforcement of human rights have prevented acts of, of genocide or mass yeah. killing in the yeah. Slavic Wars? Okay, and we have another one from here, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all speakers. I think those are very important arguments put across by everyone. Uh, it's just a, the first speaker for motion, I think it's James. Mm -hmm. yeah. You went on at length about how uh, the British had defended human rights in the past. I don't really see the relevance to current day. So my question is, is how would the British Bill of Rights enhance human rights in general or, or contribute to human rights in general today? Okay. And let's take one more back from the gentleman. Yes? Uh, hello there. Um, do we say our names or do you just say the question? Um, name and question, please. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Mosulman Cullum. Uh, I'm a librarian. Uh, I think so. My question would be this human rights issue. Um, how would you consider the reflections of history and like genocides that happened or you know, acts of, you know, like um, that counter the Human Rights Act? If it's passed, we go back in history. And you could go just as a jest, you know, to the crucifixions of someone quite prominent in history, in religious history. How far do you go back? 
Okay, so could, could you just um, reiterate exactly what, what the question is there? Okay, so, so the, the, the British uh, Human Rights Act, okay, if that goes, that, if that goes through, yeah. or the current Human Rights Act, how far do you go back to say, look, um, we need to go back in history and so they say, look, there's, there's, um, there's kind of like um, consequences to this current uh, Human Rights Act, even though yeah. it's 800 years old, as we said, or this new British law, how do you account for histories, genocides that have happened, or human rights acts, or acts of, in history, not just European, but maybe across the world, mm -hmm. how do you account for that, and how do you bring that into this kind of law? And, you know, it's a difficult question, yeah. I'm not really expecting an answer, but it's just to throw it <laughs> It sounds quite similar to the question that was raised actually just, just before, um, about how, how has the historically um, the British Bill of Rights that, that the proposition of the being responsible for the definition of slavery, how is it relevant today to today's moral norms of, of what I consider as human rights? Uh, I've talked it that way in that case and, and asked the, both sides to answer both of those questions together um, in that case. So let's put that um, to the speakers. Rather than answer the questions individually this time, I'm going to invite um, uh, both speakers from each side, just a minute or two, just to offer a few thoughts on the questions raised. You can decide which ones you want to prioritise. Okay, well, um, so on the question of uh, Strasbourg superseding the UK, um, this, this has came up several times, you know, is it a good thing that it uh, has a balance, um, provides a right of appeal, um, could the ECHR hold the UK to account? So essentially, our argument is that the conflict that is created between Strasbourg and the UK, because there is this ambiguity in the, in the Human Rights Act, is it of itself harmful. Uh, it was made mention that uh, this uh, harms our image abroad. The fact that we are seen to be in conflict with a court that says one thing and our courts say another thing is of itself harmful, and our Bill of Rights would uh, remove that um, ambiguity and remove that conflict. Um, and how would the Bill of Rights contribute to today? Well, the Bill of Rights, the Human Rights Act incorporates the ECHR into UK law, so it allows uh, people to, to take their cases to a UK court rather than to Strasbourg. Our Bill of Rights would do exactly the same thing, but what we would do is remove the ambiguity, we would ensure that the rights uh, were interpreted according to their original intent, not according to something dreamed up in Strasbourg today or tomorrow. And the history, the reason I bring up Britain's history is to show the character of Britain. That's why I mentioned the, the, the quote from Milton. The character of Britain is of a country that defends and enhances human rights. We have a long history of liberty and parliamentary democracy. We cannot forget that. Okay. Um, let's move up to the opposition to see. I'll be, I'll be yes. very quick. I think um, in terms of the question of supremacy, um, believe it or not, that's linked to the question you asked about the, the prevention of genocide. Um, you probably wouldn't be aware, uh, but of course the, the reality is that the supremacy that is spoken about in the press doesn't exist, as I've said. Um, but there are countries in Bosnia and Herzegovina as one example. The peace agreement that ended the war there actually put the European Convention of Human Rights above all national laws. That's a reflection of where that democracy was, where that struggling state was, that somebody outside had to be given, essentially, supremacy over the national instrument. But I would say that that's not the case, and that shouldn't be the case normally. I think there's a, a, a tension there, and I, I, I hear the words ambiguity over and over and over again, but not one example of where it's problematic. Okay. I didn't say that both speakers would get to say, so Paul, do you have anything to add to the proposition? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I will be brief. The British Human Rights Act of 1998, as opposed to the, the convention, the British Human Rights Act of 1998 uh, clearly could could do nothing to, uh, to prevent the uh, to prevent um, genocide or ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia and could not do anything about the Yugoslavian civil war. Um, because you know, at, when, when, when war is, is an issue, then that is when it is actually nation states and not um, ivory tower judges 
who, who make, the, uh, make the decisions and uh, make it happen. Uh, they did then impose a treaty, which was judicially devised, yes, but it was, in, in fact, NATO uh, that, that stopped that. And, uh, and, and just one other point, uh, because it, it's come up in a couple of the, con uh, the questions, and, and even in, in what my opponent just said, which is there is a bit too much of the conflating of actual rights with Britain's Human Rights Act of 1998. And that's why my colleague was talking about the development of rights throughout history, because they were very well developed prior to the uh, ill-thought-out adoption of that particular act. Okay, and finally, Jason. Uh, so, uh, something the, uh, the, the opposition keeps harking back to is, or is this, this idea that the British Bill of Rights will, will um, reinforce the original intent of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, I, so I'm, I'm curious to know how the uh, proposition know that their bill would enforce the original intent and that what is being enforced now is not the original intent. Um, it's, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about human rights being international, not a national thing. Um, that, you know, the, when they say um, we're going to bring it back to the original intent of the European Convention on Human Rights. What they seem to be indicating, what they're actually saying, I think, is the British intent, the British idea of what this European Convention on Human Rights means. They have no idea what the original intent um, uh, would would have been, um, because the the you know the original intent, I, I would say, is uh, you know, or the the intent of what what uh, human rights are. It is it does evolve and does change over time, um, but I think that with the idea that there are some fixed human rights that are international is a fairly clear uh, one and uh, should be enforced by a, uh, an act that makes reference to a European convention um, rather than simply a, uh, a British uh, in, uh, interpretation of that, even if we do insist it is the original intent, quote unquote. Okay, let's have a few more points to finish up before we move to our closing speeches. Does anybody else want to say? There's a question on this point. Uh, this, this, yeah. These questions won't get any response from our speakers, but I think I'm keen to hear as many as possible. So I'll make these three the very last, but they'll all be standalone comments. If you have a question, I'll take you as well, sir. If you have a question, I'll ask the speakers to address it in your summary speeches. Very, very quick though, 30 seconds for each of you, please. I will enforce this by means of the gavel. So, mm -hmm. let's start over here. Two of you over here, hands please. Yes, let's start with you, madam, and then we'll move to Camille just behind you. Go ahead. With the enforcement of the Counterterrorism and Security Act, and also um, a demonstration of mismanagement of our personal information, uh, why should we trust the UK government to um, uh, construct a, a, an act which which um, deals with things as fragile as our privacy. Um, what have they done to earn our trust recently in terms of human rights and, and our personal information? Okay, Camille. Um, James kind of implied that the, um, the Human Rights Act in Strasbourg would kept on changing, but I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. And just kind of put forward the question that put like, creating the Bill of Rights, do you think that would isolate Britain even further from the international community? And, yeah. Okay, that's it come here. And two questions we had over here. Uh, Hands up, please. Comment. Sorry. Uh, I'll come to you first, sir, and then we'll finish off with the lady at the back. So, go ahead. Um, one of the gentlemen, I can't remember whether it was this one, Sorry. Um, he made a comment that Britain um, has examples of where it's dis displayed justice and fairness in, in its previous history, but it's also on the other side where it's displayed a lot of like unjust behaviour and like foreign policy, which a lot of people would question. So often or not, it is up to it is fair that a third party be the judge of and review something that they they have a decision to make on, because often or not they're advancing their own national interests which isn't a bad thing, but often or not, it can trample on other people's rights. So a third party that observes it from like a, a third, like, a, a third, like another perspective often finds holes and reasons why something that they're carrying out might not be 
fair in another respect. So it's more of a comment really, wasn't the question. Okay, and finally from the leg at the back, we've been waiting a while, go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually I would like oh, to... Oh sorry, beg your pardon, there was a lady just in front of you, oh, but I, I, will, I, I will happily come to you as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Alison Jones, I'm from the Centre for Social Justice Work, and I was just going to ask you to comment on the fact that you have been working with Alison Jones for quite a while, Okay, and sorry, I'm now back to you, man. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to have some examples, actually, of um, where uh, the Human Rights Act conflict with UK court and how the UK will improve that um, in a bit of detail. About it. Also, I would like to say that the UK should um, give good examples to many other countries who look for the UK as an example for democracy. Uh, I mean, in Egypt, for instance, uh, it's promoted by Egyptian media and it's very well known by millions of Egyptians that David Cameron has said that when it comes to national security, no one talked to me about human rights, which is not true. He did not exactly say that, but even though it just got to show the impact of UK and the world when it comes to this issue. So UK should be promoting the other countries to all human rights uh, principles as a universal uh, for all. Okay. So now we move to closing speeches. We ask one speaker from each side to give a two-minute closing. No more than that, please. Just summing up their arguments to tonight. It's their final chance to pitch to you before we have our final vote. As per our custom, uh, we start with the opposition first, and then we move to the proposition to close. So who will be closing for the opposition tonight? That would be Jason. In that case, welcome back, Jason. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have had um, a, a number of different arguments uh, made here tonight, and um, I'm going to put it to you that the, the opposition has won those arguments. Uh, so firstly, we had a lot of discussion about the ambiguity with this um, must-take-into-account phrase. Um, the the uh, proposition argued that's ambiguous, we've argued that it's not ambiguous. The UK uh, Supreme Court is supreme, so it, uh, its judgments will trump any of those of Strasbourg, even if Strasbourg happens to disagree with the ruling. Um, there's the idea of integrating the other, another argument that we have had is that there's the idea of the international uh, internationality of human rights with uh, the proposition proposing that we work under some uh, and a common law system which is different, incompatible with European systems and that um, we, we should, uh, we should you know, just uh, go our own way and have our own interpretation enshrined in our own British Bill of Rights. And we say, no, that's, that's incorrect. There are, there are rights, human rights are international. Uh, they are applicable to all and Britain should be doing its bit to promote that to promote that so that wherever, um, wherever human rights are being trammeled, people can point to Britain as an example. And the best way we do that is by um, having this dialogue internationally about what human rights means, and that is what uh, the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights um, have uh, encouraged us to do. And finally, a question which the proposition hasn't even um, managed to address is the fact that even if we wanted to do this, it's impossible because Wales and Scotland um, won't, won't allow it, they won't agree to go along with this abolition, and Northern Ireland will uh, collapse into further chaos if we try and take uh, reopen the Good Friday Agreement, which we'll need to do in order to uh, remove the Human Rights Act. So, for those reasons, I beg you to oppose this motion. Thank you. And to close tonight's debate with a closing speech from the proposition, we welcome back Paul. Welcome Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, my opponent has put the Human Rights Act of 1998 and the European Convention on Human Rights into the same sentence and on the same footing. And that is where we disagree. This side of the House supports the European Convention on Human Rights 
but not the Human, the human Rights Act of 1998. He uh, says we would be internationally isolated, Britain would be internationally isolated. Uh, that's, no, that's nonsense. Britain was not internationally isolated prior to 1998 because it upheld the European Convention on Human Rights. He says it would be politically impossible. Nothing is politically impossible. You know, devolution itself was politically impossible until it happened. And then when it happened, oh, it's not politically impossible. So it is not politically impossible. It is not even politically impossible in Northern Ireland. If the, if the Good Friday Agreement is so bad that amending, that amending it with the, the Bill of Rights instead of the Human Rights Act would crush it, then, then, then it, it, will, it will fail because it is that bad, not because it is amended with the, human, with the Bill of Rights rather than the Human Rights Act. So no, Britain would not be internationally isolated. It is not politically impossible. And the whole point of our argument is that the, the Human Rights Act of 1998 itself was unnecessary and caused the ambiguity. There would be no ambiguity about uh, UK courts taking into account what the Strasbourg Court says, but for the Human Rights Act of 1998. It is the Human Rights Act of 19, 1998 which instructs UK courts and therefore puts them into conflict with Strasbourg. And that, I put it to you, is not a good thing. It is not a good thing for British law to be in conflict the way it is now. Right now, it is in a state of, uh, state of incompatibility, which means that the whole issue of uh, sovereignty has been kicked into the long grass. And I suspect it will stay there until the next time it is kicked further into the long grass. That's what's wrong with the Human Rights Act of 1998. The Human Rights Convention is fine. I beg you to support the motion. It's close to building my gavel, but luckily <laughs> Paul did not force me to raise that. We have to use it for tonight. So we, uh, <laughs> it is, although it is pretty cool having a gavel. <laughs> All right. Now at the moment of truth, where do you stand, having now heard all of the speakers? Again, you have three options. You can vote in favour of the motion. You can oppose the motion. Or you can choose to abstain from the vote if you are still undecided or if you have become undecided as a result of the speeches you've heard tonight. <laughs> Let me reiterate one more time the motion. This House would abolish the Human Rights Act of 1998 as specified by the proposition. If you are in favour, so if you agree with James and Paul, Please raise your hands now. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. Congratulations on a 400% uh, increase there. <laughs> <laughs> if you are opposed to the motion, please raise your hands now. And all those abstaining who are still under silence, please raise your hand. Count nine. Okay. Well, in that case, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is pretty clear that tonight's motion has failed, and we have seen a strong victory for um, the opposition. However, I caveat that by saying that um, we have seen an increase in number of votes taken by the proposition, and interestingly, and perhaps importantly, a decrease in the number of people who were, who were abstaining, so the number of people who were undecided before the debate as compared to those who were undecided after the debate. So it's very interesting to see that a good few people have made up their minds 
as a result of the speeches that they've heard tonight, even if it isn't quite enough to change um, the turn the tide of the debate, so to speak. That said, uh, I would like one more time for you to join me in thanking our four sensational speakers for an wonderful <laughs> each of you for coming tonight and for your contributions as well. I'm certainly eager to hear afterwards from those of you who did change your minds to find out a little more about why you changed your minds. And you are all welcome to Debating London anytime. Our public debates are free to attend also. And our next one is coming up on October 7th. The motion for which reads, revealing that the private lives of politicians is not in the public interest. <laughs> Just Google us debate in London and find out exactly where we are and what's coming up. And with that, I hand over to our host, Shabana, who I'd also like you to join me in thanking for organising tonight. Thank you. Also to Tony, um, you have chin and actually run the entire event, so I feel like you've done actually most of the, the legwork here. Um, I don't have any further announcements for City Circle. We do have an event next week on Friday, which is on unregistered marriages. So this is exploring the legal status of the Nagar and the impact of that within the Muslim community, whether that should be changed and if so, how. Um, that's the only announcement that I have, unless Ramiz, there's anything that you want to announce? No, well you have a bit of time, I think, to 